Okay. Today we're going to start with an announcement from the tutor, Ryan Anderson. Hey everybody. Midterm's coming up. So my review session is this Friday in Science Hall 174 from 6 to 8. Hope to see you all there. I'm also hoping to leave about 10 minutes to 15 minutes at the end of the lecture on Friday to answer questions. So be prepared to come ask questions then as well. Uh, but I do recommend you go to Ryan's review session. He took this course last year, as I said before, and it's a good source, probably better than most graduate TAs for uh, getting your questions answered. So today is a very important day in the history of immunology. 47 years ago today, your immunology professor was born. So you can bring up your cards and gifts after to the podium. Thank you. You may not be clapping Monday. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is just a preview of what, we're, uh, what the exam's going to look like. A few people have asked me, is there going to be a practice midterm posted or previous midterm? Essentially, that's what I've been doing in the practice quizzes. I'm just taking the pieces of last year's midterm that apply to those chapters. So rather than give it all at the end, I've been breaking it up. Uh, I'll post the last practice quiz actually this, this afternoon, re relevant to chapters 9 and 6. Um, and then uh, the answers for that may be Friday or Saturday. Uh, the answers to last week's quiz I'll post tomorrow or Friday. So if you haven't had a chance to do last week's quiz yet, practice quiz, you should do that soon. Uh, the format of the exam itself is, is very similar in terms of the types of questions. There are going to be some true-false questions, some multiple choice questions, fill in the blanks, and short answers. You can see that about um, 60 points overall comes from these. So uh, try to finish your true-false and multiple choice within the first 10 or 15 minutes so you give yourself extra time. Uh, I like to give you an extra five minutes just to make sure you have enough time to complete this exam, and I'll let the next instructor know that we will be a maybe a little late getting out of here, but we may have to hand in some exams out in the foyer afterwards if, people, if we can't get anyone, everyone in and out. Um, but my goal is that you'll have enough time to do this exam and that it won't be, you won't be pressed for time. Uh, I, you know, the, the questions I think, I hope, will be very clear and straightforward, but I'll be here and so will the proctors. If you have any questions, raise your hand. I'll come try to answer the question. We will have a seating chart, a random seating chart. It will be posted at the entrances to the lecture hall, so come in and see where you're going to sit. Uh, if you want a left-handed seat, let me know. Uh, you need to bring your ID, place it on your desk during the exam. We'll do some spot checks to make sure you're in the right seat. And at the end, you do have to show it when you're turning in your exam. Uh, please don't forget uh, to bring your student ID. If you've lost your student ID, let us know. We can accept a driver's license, but we really want to make sure there's no cheating. Uh, and therefore, all the backpacks, everything you have that can hold anything that you might cheat with is going to be on the side. All your electronic devices will be turned off. Uh, so just bring pencils and pens. We'll provide the scantrons. We'll use pencil for these parts, pen for these. If you want a chance to get a, a regrade, which we'll offer chances for a regrade, you have to use pen for these sections. Um, you might want to, if you're not sure, pencil it in first and then write over in pen later. But if you turn in an exam that's all in pencil uh, and you want to regrade, you will not be eligible for that. Any questions about the midterm? OK. So we left off last time talking about IgA after talking about IgG. And that leads to this figure, which is interesting and will be important to many of you uh, when you start your families and you realize that your children and your infants in particular get sick very frequently. Uh, and that's because it takes a while for their immune systems to really get into gear. Now, if it weren't for the passive transfer of IgG in the placenta, through the placenta and IgA uh, through, the, through the milk, uh, they'd really be in bad shape. But you have the IgG that's present in the blood at birth. Once the umbilical cord is broken, there's no more IgG coming from the mother. And over time, over a few months, that IgG uh, it gets degraded slowly, but eventually it does. And it, the, the first isotype that's secreted as the infant or an infant and, and newborn starts to encounter pathogens is IgM and takes some time for them to make their own IgG and IgA. Uh, 
So there's this transient period between three months to a year when there are low IgG levels in the blood and tissues. Uh, and depending on how long the breastfeeding goes, uh, and I believe there's IgA in formula as well, uh, the protection may or may not last long enough for them to synthesize their own IgA. But if you end up putting your kid in daycare any time before one year, they will get sick frequently. I can tell you from experience. Uh, fortunately, they have enough passive transfer immunity to keep them from getting really sick most of the time. But it is a danger period because of this, this, uh, the time it takes for their own immune systems to ramp up. So we've talked about IgM, IgG, IgA. We're going to postpone IgE until uh, a little bit later and talk about key functions of those other three isotypes. And we're going to start with neutralization. And we'll give you three examples. Neutralization basically means binding to an antigen on a pathogen to prevent that pathogen from getting access to a cell. It's mostly carried out by IgG and IgA, which are abundant in, in the extracellular spaces for IgG or for IgA in the body cavities. And the first example is for a virus. Viruses need to enter cells. Uh, in order to infect the cells. So here's an example of two brothers, a twin brother who doesn't have, didn't get the flu shot, and the virus enters, uh, binds to the cell surface and enters the cell and replicates. And on the left, um, the, uh, the other brother did get his flu shot and has made IgA antibodies that are hanging around on the surface of the lungs and the nasal passage where uh, the, the virus uh, gets inhaled. And now the IgA antibodies stick to the surface of the virus and prevent it from attaching. It cannot infect the cells. There are a couple of proteins on the virus, on influenza in particular. The, the protein that is most important for neutralization is the hemagglutinin protein, or HA. And HA binds to carbohydrates, shown here, these little hexagons, on the surface of epithelial cells. Uh, and um, if you want to read more about the fi in the figure caption in your textbook, it'll give you more information about this. But the basic concept is that you may, if you've been immunized or pre previously exposed in this influenza strain, you're, you will make, you'll have IgA antibodies that will bind to the HA and neutralize its ability to attach and infect cells. Okay, so neutralization is a pretty simple concept. I'll go through the other examples. Uh, this is for bacteria. Um, some bacteria actually need to attach to cells or extracellular matrix in order to uh, reproduce. Examples are the gonorrhea bacteria and strep uh, bacteria in the throat. And so here is our two children, one who has pre-existing antibodies to the strep pyogenes bacteria and a sister without those antibodies. And you can see that in this sister, the bacteria can attach uh, I think it's not shown, but to the, yeah, to the extracellular matrix proteins like fibronectin. And they stay in, in the throat and multiply, and they get strep, uh, a sore throat. Neutralizing antibodies, the IgA antibodies, will prevent attachment of the strep bacteria to the extracellular matrix. And now the cilia here will uh, sweep all of the bacteria into the gut, and they'll be destroyed. Or the bacterial population is limited and kept at a steady state. So neutralizing bacterial surfaces so they can't attach to the extracellular matrix or in other conditions, in other cases, to cells that they attach to. Now, a very important function of neutralizing antibodies is to protect us from bacterial toxins. And this table here shows some examples, many of which you've heard of, like anthrax and gangrene and cholera, tetanus, diphtheria, botulism probably heard of all of these, in fact. <clears throat> and so the danger from bacteria isn't just that they're going to replicate and, and uh, directly cause uh, disease. They, they actually make toxins that disable the host in some way and will help the, the bacteria spread. So for cholera, the cholera toxin ends up leading to changes in the intestinal epithelial cells that leads to diarrhea so that the cholera toxin gets into the water and can be passed to other people in the population. But these toxins, they, they, they often will be similar to host proteins, and they can attach to host receptors and gain access to cells and change their behavior. And they do so in very, very small quantities. So you have to be able to make antibodies that can get into the tissues where these 
toxins are being produced and neutralize them before they can attach to cells. So the details here are just for your interest uh, to show you the importance of, you know, across many different pathogens of, of these sorts of toxins. But the, the key figure is figure 928, which shows a toxin usually has two components, one that binds the receptor and one that eventually, when the receptor is internalized, gains access to the cytoplasm and does the damage, poisoning the cell. If you have a neutralizing antibody that binds a toxin, it, uh, the receptor binding component, it will prevent it from binding to the cell and you don't have any damage. So you might ask, well, we, we get uh, immunized as children for tetanus and diphtheria and we get boosters later on for tetanus. How can you inject a toxin that's going to damage your cells to induce a protective immune response? And the answer is that these vaccines use denatured forms of these toxins known as toxoids. They're not completely denatured linear peptides, but they're denatured enough so that they, they've lost their ability to enter cells and cause damage. But they've retained epitopes that can induce an antibody response, and those antibodies can protect against the toxoid or the native toxin. So we immunize infants with diphtheria and tetanus toxins that are denatured as toxoids, uh, and that protects them from the natural toxin that might be produced upon infection. There's a lot of toxins in nature that are not derived from bacteria or viruses, and we don't have vaccines for all of them. For example, certain snake venoms and uh, certain insects and scorpions and things like that. So, we're not going to immunize everybody for scorpion venom because very few of us are ever going to be bitten by a scorpion. But these things can be dangerous and so what the uh, medical community has done is they've distributed to all the hospitals serum from a horse that's been, or another large animal that's been immunized with a toxoid from various naturally occurring toxins. And when you use a horse, you get so much serum that you can basically make antibodies that can treat the entire world almost. So. If you happen to be bitten by a, a venomous snake or a scorpion and you go to the local hospital, they will inject you with serum from a horse that will neutralize those toxins before you, you die or have paralysis. And that's another example of passive transfer of immunity or passive immunization. Instead of immunizing you with a tox, toxin or toxoid, you give antibodies that will neutralize that. It's only going to protect you short term because you're not getting the cells that produce the antibodies. Uh, but it will, it will keep you alive. Now, you're really out of luck if you get bitten by the same snake, snake a second time. And why do you think that is? I mean, you have uh, antibodies against the serum that you're getting. Right. So you've made antibodies against the toxin, but also against the horse antibodies. And now your secondary response to the horse antibodies would be really, really bad and cause something called serum sickness. So. If that happens to you and you get saved by one of these, try to stay out of the desert or wherever it is that you got bitten by a snake, because the second time is not going to be good. Any questions about neutralization? Okay, so we talked about the alternative pathway of complement activation, the lectin pathway, and the classical pathway activated by, by CRP. C-reactive protein. Now we're going to talk about complement activation by antibodies through the classical pathway. And this was the first method of complement activation that was ever discovered, which is why it's called classical. But it also refers to C-reactive protein, as I mentioned. If you look at all the antibody isotypes in humans, the most effective at, at binding and a activating complement are IgM and IgG1 and IgG3. Uh, and what ha and basically, this figure explains how this happens. Well, first I want to say, complement doesn't always bind to these isotypes. It only binds to these isotypes when they are already on the surface of a pathogen. And that is because IgM has two forms. When it's a pentamer in solution, it has this planar form, like a big frisbee or some sort of disk. But when it, it binds to the surface of the pathogen, the antibody, antigen binding arms tend to point down, so you have what's called the staple form. Looks a little bit like a spider or, a stap or staples. And that changes the conformation in this region here. So now the C1 protein and the, the CQ 
port, C1Q portion of C1, the globular heads of this protein can recognize the staple form of IgM. And that leads to activation of the proteases, these other subunits of C1, that can lead to formation of the classical C3 convertase. And then uh, you get deposition of C3B and release of C3A for, um, you know, for inflammation, phagocytosis. You can get the C5 and uh, membrane attack complex. For IgG, again, IgG, free IgG does not bind uh, and activate complement because it has a pretty low affinity. One IgG molecule, FC portion, has a pretty low affinity for C1Q. But when you have multiple IgG molecules bound to the surface of the pathogen, uh, now you get an avidity effect like we saw before with the pentameric IgM. Multiple binding sites together, each individual interaction may be low affinity, but together multiple C1Q head groups will interact with IgG molecules and that will lead to the initiation of the classical pathway. Something important to remember is that even when you activate the complement system through the classical pathway, or indeed through the MBL, the lectin pathway, it can be amplified by the alternative pathway. And that's illustrated in figure 932. Initially, these are the C1, this is a C1 uh, from the top down binding to the surface of the pathogen by antibodies, IgM or IgG. And then you'll get the C4B, which is part of the classical C3 convertase, and that will uh, form the C3 convertase that deposits C3B now on the surface here in a little ring around uh, this initial area of attachment. Each of, the, each of these C3B molecules can then recruit factor B and become its own C3 convertase. So you get rings of more C3B deposited around the initial site. So the, the alternative pathway amplifies the initial complement activation event. Does that make sense? And going back to figure 934 and looking at the right side now, um, when you make high affinity antibodies or just a lot of IgM, uh, and in the course of infection, you'll get lysis and killing of the bacteria or the yeast and some of the antigens from that pathogen will be free in solution in the blood or the, or the tissues. And the antibodies will bind to that and will lead to recruitment of complement and activate complement on the surface of a, of a pathogen fragment. It can be a single protein or a piece of the cell wall. Um, but these are called immune complexes because they're, it's not an entire pathogen. It's a piece of the pathogen bound to antibodies and to complement fragments. It's important to remove these from the blood because if they accumulate too much, they tend to uh, kind of clog up the kidneys and cause kidney damage. And that's one of the main problems in lupus is the accumulation of immune complexes in the blood that, that then accumulate in the kidneys. So how do we remove these immune complexes? Shown in figure 935, you have these small antigen antibody complexes that activate complement. Here's C3B. Um, the first complement receptor we're going to talk about is called complement receptor 1 or CR1. And it, it's on a number of different cell types, but it's very highly expressed on red blood cells or erythrocytes. It's kind of convenient. In addition to carrying oxygen uh, around the body, they have these complement receptors that can pick up immune complexes. And then as the red blood cell uh, passes through the liver or spleen, there are macrophages that have other receptors uh, that can also bind immune complexes and basically detach it from the red blood cell and then will endocytose and degrade it. So it's kind of a handoff or baton system. The in, immune complexes are picked up by the red blood cells and then handed over to the macrophages in the liver or spleen for destruction. So this chapter nine, chapter 9 has a lot of details about different IgG subclasses and their, <clears throat> their functions, and also about, <clears throat> sorry, about the next topic, which is FC receptors. 
partly because the, the author of the textbook, Peter Parham, ha happens to work on these things, I, I think. So he gives a lot of detail. Um, so as, if, as you're reading the chapter, if you get a little worn out or, or worn down by it, just remember that only parts that I will ask you about on the exam will be what's in the notes. So you can see this guy likes FC receptors. There's a huge table here, table 946. And FC receptors are, are essential for the process of obstinization, which is the second function or third function of, of antibodies. We've talked about neutralization. We've talked about complement activation. Obstinization can lead to phagocytosis uh, by, by macrophages and neutrophils. And that's because of these FC receptors. They bind the FC portion of the antibody, and they're expressed in all sorts of different cell types. Uh, different receptors are found on different ones. Uh, in general, when we refer to a cell that has an FC receptor, the, ge the general term would be an effector cell. You saw that in the very first lecture where there was a cell we hadn't even named yet that is a macrophage in the tissue, and it was just named as an effector cell. So don't think it's a new cell type we haven't defined yet. It's just a general term for some cell with an FC receptor that can uh, do something when it binds antibody. So the way that the FC receptors are named is based on which isotype they bind. So if it's an IgG, Receptor for IgG, it gets the Greek symbol gamma. You can see there's five different FC gamma receptors. If it binds IgE, it's FC epsilon, and there's one of these. If it binds IgA, it's FC alpha, and there's one of these. There's only two things I want you to, to get, three things I want you to get from this table. One is that the nomenclature I just told you the second is that all FC receptors in their extracellular domains have Ig-like domains. So they're members of the Ig superfamily, but they're not variable from one person to the next. And the third thing is that they are, most of them are complexes of different proteins, one that's involved in binding the FC portion of antibody and the other that's involved in signaling to the inside of the cell. I guess the fourth thing is that different FC receptors are found on different cells and have different functions. But the specific arrangements here, how many Ig domains, what's the nature of the signaling chains, the names, all that, you can forget about uh, for the purposes of this class. Now you have the same problem that we had with complement. Why does IgG or IgA or IgE, um, why does IgG, for example, not always bind to effector cells and lead to constant attempts at phagocytosis uh, even if there's no antigen bind, bound. And that's shown in, in figure 941. And again, it's, it's, it's an issue of, of clustering, of having many binding events. So free bacteria, uh, free antibodies have a low affinity for most FC receptors. But now if you have an antibody coating a bacterium, there are multiple FC receptors uh, that are engaged with multiple antibodies, only shown are two here, but typically might be 10 or 100. And that increases the overall affinity of the interaction, and it leads to clustering of the FC receptor. And as we'll see later for B cells and T cells, clustering of receptors is really important for sending an activating signal to the inside of the cell. So that leads to the process of phagocytosis and eventual destruction in the phagosome. Any questions about that? Yeah. Do you, ever, do you ever get more than one isotype binding to a bacteria at the same time? Yeah, you might have more than one isotype bound to the bacteria at the same time. You might have all different IgGs. But IgG1 and 3 are the ones that tend to have the highest affinity um, for FC receptors. Okay, um, so most of phagocytosis, mediated, phagocytosis is mediated by receptors for IgG. But what if you have a pathogen that's too big to be engulfed by the macrophage? Well, eosinophils also have receptors for Ig, IgG, but they're specialized to, uh, instead of mediating phagocytosis, when their FC receptors are engaged by 
the parasite that's coated with an antibodies, the eosinophils will release the contents of their granules in the direction of the parasite. And the granules will attack and kill the pathogen. So E stands for eosinophil. This is a parasite, a schistosome parasite uh, that we're not going to talk about in this class. You may learn about in parasitology. But it, obviously, it's way too big to be ingested by a macrophage. But you've got to destroy it. Eosinophils play a major role there. Now, going back to this figure here, uh, there, as far as we know, no FC receptors for IgM. But nevertheless, IgM is important for phagocytosis. Why is that? Because it can activate complement, and you can get complement fragments on the surface of the bacteria. And there are complement receptors not shown here on the surface of the phagocyte, which can recognize those complement fragments. And that leads to the same process. All right. So the next function of FC receptors is called ADCC. I wish it was shown in this slide. Maybe I will type it in. Well, you can remember ADCC. Um, it stands for antibody-dependent cyto cell-mediated cytotoxicity. That's all in your notes. We've learned that NK cells can recognize virally infected cells and stress cells and cancer cells and kill them. And one way they do this is through antibodies as a bridge. If you have a cell that's been infected with a virus and the virus is starting to replicate and produce proteins and getting ready to bud out of the surface of the cell, those viral proteins will be on the surface of the cell. If you've made antibodies that recognize that, that viral protein, you'll start getting host antibodies coating the infected cell. And the hope here is that the NK cell will come along and kill that before the virus is finished budding and, and, and leave this cell. And NK cells have an FC gamma receptor called uh, FC gamma R3, also known as CD16, uh, that has very high affinity for IgG when it's bound to the surface of target cells. And what happens is that leads to clustering of that FC receptor and the NK cell will kill the target cell or, or cause it to commit suicide by apoptosis. The mechanism is very similar to how NK cells uh, kill virally infected cells directly by re recognizing activating receptors or how CTLs kill virally infected cells that you'll learn about in a later chapter. Um, now this is in chapter nine, so in the text it will talk about more about how it's similar to other processes you've already learned about, but in this lecture, we're presenting it first. So those details for now are not important, like what's in the granules. Just know that NK cells can kill virally infected cells if they're coated with antibody through an FC receptor um, recognition mechanism. And that's called ADCC. Question? Yeah. So does that mean eosinophils don't have uh, FC receptors? Eosinophils do have FC receptors. Yeah. So, oh, so they have FC gamma. R1, 2, A, 2, B2, 3. But every, what happens once the signal is sent differs depending on the cell type. In the eosinophils, they, they don't um, try to, you know, they don't have the granules that can heal, kill host cells. They have granules that release substances that are toxic to parasites. Uh, and macrophages, they don't release granules at all. They, recognition by FC receptors leads to phagocytosis. So the same receptor on a different cell might lead to a different outcome. No, because eosinophil will never kill a host cell. Oh, okay. It yeah. Yeah. The contents of its granules are toxic to the parasite, but not to the host cells. That's not entirely true, because a lot of the lung damage you get in, in asthma is from eosinophils being too activated and releasing substances that are not really good for the long-term health of your lungs. But for, for uh, this, for what you need to understand here, a macrophage or neutrophil when its FC receptors are engaged, will mediate phagocytosis and destruction inside the cell. Eosinophils will release granules that kill the, uh, the large parasites. And K cells will release granules that kill the virally infected cell. All those are mediated by FC receptors, but the outcome is different. 
So we've gone through IgM, IgG, IgA, and many of the functions in, in neutralization, complement activation, and phagocytosis. The one we haven't talked about yet is IgE. IgE, if you go back to an earlier table, you'll see that it's, it's really at very low levels in the blood, and you hardly find it at all uh, in the blood or even in extracellular fluid. And that's because it's mostly bound to mast cells that have this FC epsilon receptor 1. This is an exception to the other FC receptors I told you have kind of low affinity for individual Ig molecules. The FC epsilon receptor has extremely high affinity for IgE. So any IgE that's produced by a plasma cell as it moves around the body will just be stuck to a surface of mast cells and just stays there, never comes off essentially. And as you can see from this figure, IgE and the mast cells they're attached to are mostly found just underneath the skin, um, just underneath the other epithelial tissues of the gut, the, uh, the lungs, the urogenital tract. And basically, they are an important defense against parasites that might be trying to take up residence or gain access to the tissues. A resting mast cell, this is what it looks like in an electron micrograph, uh, electron microscopy. This is a uh, two-dimensional drawing. You can see they have these huge darkly staining granules. Here's the nucleus. Um, and, you can, and you can imagine here, and you can see here, that they have all these FC epsilon receptors and they're all bound to IgE antibody. If an antigen comes along that's recognized by that IgE and leads to clustering of the FC epsilon receptors, it's not really shown very well here because they're the same distance here that they are here, but just imagine these are all diffusing around the surface of the cell and then when an antigen comes along, um, two or three of them get clustered in the same location. That leads to an activation signal to the cell, and that leads to this very dramatic release of the granule contents. And what's in the granules, one of the main components is histamine, but there are other ones as well. And this is a, a very powerful vasodilator. It leads to opening up of the local blood vessels, increased blood flow, migration of other cells and factors and antibodies to the site of the immune response. And it can lead to very violent reactions. For example, uh, if you have a food, a, a parasite in your gut um, and you have mast cells that are activated uh, just in the, you know, beneath the tissues, of, uh, beneath the epithelial cells of your gut, all those mediators that are released can lead to um, vomiting or can lead to diarrhea. It's basically the body's way of trying to ex expel parasites. And if, if you have an allergy to cats or hay fever, you know that if, when you, you just can't stop sneezing and your eyes start to water, the body is just trying to eliminate, physically eliminate those parasites. In the developing world, it's important that you have this immune mechanism and that you have allergy because it's protecting you. Uh, in developed countries like Irvine, <laughs> Um, we don't commonly encounter parasites that we need to get rid of. So mast cells and IgE is mainly a nuisance. It's mainly the cause of all these allergies and even more threatening conditions like asthma and anaphylaxis. So for our break today, just want to see if, has anybody heard of allergy shots? Yeah? So it seems kind of strange if you're allergic to um, bee stings or, peanut, or peanuts or cats or whatever, why would you go to the doctor and be injected with the same, the, the, act, the, the substance that you're, that's going to cause this terrible allergic reaction? Any ideas? Anybody know how it works? Yeah. Well, does it circumvent the system and go straight through the blood? That... Uh, that's sort of part of it, yeah. It's not so much the amounts, I don't think. I think it's, it has to do with how the, how the shots are given, what's in the shot besides the allergen. Yeah? I'm not sure that that's true either. I mean, I, th I think 
When, if you inject it into the blood, uh, it may not, or if you inject it into the arm, it may not be in a spot that's going to cause a, a, a terrible reaction. But the real, the real reason, I mean, there's, there's, there's a primary reason and then there's a secondary reason that maybe came to be appreciated later. But the real reason is, has, to, it has to do with you're trying to switch the body from making IgE antibodies to making IgG antibodies. If you can induce a really strong IgG response with lots of neutralizing antibodies, they will be produced in the blood, they will get into tissues, and they will be around. And then when this allergen comes along, IgG will neutralize it before it can attach to IgE. So you're basically trying to outcompete the IgE with an IgG response. You have to do it in a way that doesn't induce a, a dangerous reaction. Uh, so I'm not really that much of an expert in how they do that, but that's the general idea. But the second point that's been appreciated later is that if you do it in a certain way, you, might, you can also induce um, regulatory T cells or maybe other types of regulatory cells that can suppress the further production, uh, generation of IgE producing cells. And over time, that will lead to um, loss of uh, redu reduced amounts of IgE. So it's pretty clever, I think. But it, it requires a true knowledge of the immune system. Oops. All right, so we just did that. OK, so Friday's lecture is going to be about the, the details of B cell development. Um, I'm going to begin to introduce it here. And I might even finish before the end of our allotted time. So we might be able to do a mini review session uh, or at least cover the material from the, if you have questions about the lecture in about 10 minutes. We're now back to chapter six. We've entirely skipped chapter five. We'll come back to that after the midterm. Chapter six is about B cell development and figure 6.1 just is basically the life of a B cell. The first step is repertoire assembly that occurs in the bone marrow and this is where you generate the army. This is where you generate this huge uh, population, diverse population of B cells, each with a different B cell receptor based on VDJ recombination, junctional diversity, and pairing of heavy and light chains. Now, before you let these B cells out of the bone marrow to start dealing with infection, you have a process where you, called negative selection where you need to eliminate any cells that are, that are self-reactive. So alteration, elimination, or inactivation of B cell receptors that bind to components of the human body. And this is at a stage that's known as the immature B cell stage. We'll come back to these terms later on. And we're not going to talk about positive selection. The next phase, once you've weeded out any self-reactive B cells, is the rest of the B cells are now mature B cells. They circulate between blood and secondary lymphoid tissues, the lymph nodes, the spleen, the Peyer's patches, et cetera, while they look for antigens, search for infection. Those few clones that find a pathogen or an antigen that, that they recognize will be clonally expanded. And then they will um, eventually give rise to plasma cells that secrete antibodies or be retained as memory cells that can produce a very rapid secondary response. And this is misspelled here. It should say infection. So this just, um, just briefly explains the recirculation process. The heart is uh, basically shown here to represent the vascular system. Cells be B cells develop and undergo VDJ rearrangements in the bone marrow. Once they're released into the bloodstream, they recirculate through spleen, lymph node, and Peyer's patches, and other gut-associated lymphoid tissues, and other mucosal tissues. So a little bit more detail about the stages in the bone marrow is shown in figure 6-4. It starts with a stem cell, first the hematopoietic stem cell, and then the common lymphoid progenitor. And in these cells, there's been no heavy chain or light chain rearrangement, and there's no Ig on the surface. There's two general stages known as the pro-B cell and the pre-B cell. Each one of them has two substages, early pro-B cell, late pro-B cell, large pre-B and small pre-B, and we will come back to those in the next lecture. 
but you'll notice that heavy chain rearrangement occurs in the pro B cell stages and light chain rearrangement occurs in the pre B cell, in fact the small pre B cell stage. Immature B cells as I told you is the stage where you remove any self reactive B cells. They've already made heavy and light chains and they express IgM on the surface. Only those cells that survive that process because they're not self reactive will leave the bone marrow and now enter the bloodstream and the spleen and the lymph node and at that point they begin to generate IgM and IgD at the same time and they're known as mature B cells. They're also called naive B cells uh, until they encounter antigens. Figure 6-5 is the last figure we'll go through today and it shows you a little bit more detail about the cell biology and the cell cell inter interactions that occur during early B cell development in the bone marrow. And I want to introduce you to a cell type known as the bone marrow stromal cell. It's shown in two dimensions here. It's basically a surface that the developing B cells attach to and uh, interact with during the development process. They, the bone marrow stromal cells you can also see in this um, light micrograph in a, in a cell culture system where the stromal cells are, are kind of spread out on the surface of the plastic here. A um, little bit hard to see, very pale and then these little dots are the bone marrow cells in developing B cells that are kind of stuck to the arms of these um, and sometimes to the cell bodies of these stromal cells. They provide factors and ligands to B cells uh, that are essential. If you remove st uh, stromal cells from these in vitro cultures you will not be able to get any B cell development. So one of the signals is a cell contact signal and that's through what are known as cell adhesion molecules, abbreviated CAMs here. This is not a, a individual receptor, it's a class of receptors known as cell adhesion molecules. And if this is the glue that holds the developing B cell to the bone marrow stromal cell. And in many cases cells need to be attached to other cells in order to survive and this is one of those examples. Not only did the this cell adhesion molecule signal for survival, uh, they may also receive developmental signals from these cell adhesion molecules. But the developmental signals are, are so sorry, just to step back. Um, these, this is one type of cell adhesion molecule pair um, just in case you're interested. I'm not going to ask you about these names, VLA4 and VCAM1, but you might recognize this. It looks like an integrin that we, we learned about early, earlier and this sounds like ICAM1. Yes, it's an Ig-like molecule uh, similar to ICAM1 but expressed on bone marrow stromal cells. So that same adhesion receptor pair is here but now we're going to talk about the secreted factors um, and other membrane uh, ligand receptor pairs that are involved in guiding the B cells through their different stages of development. One of them that I do want you to know which is actually important in, in earlier stages as well in the, in the hematopoietic cell is known as stem cell factor or SCF. And this operates at the very earliest stages of B cell development in this early pro B cell. Later on, the later stages of pro B cell and pre B cell, a receptor is expressed known as the IL-7 receptor and IL-7, a secreted product produced by the bone marrow stromal cell will bind to the IL-7 receptor and that's important for some of the later stages that we'll learn about in the next lecture. And lastly, not shown in this figure, uh, bone marrow stromal cells secrete cytokines that help attract the developing B cells to this location so they can stick to and interact with the bone marrow stromal cells. This is just a electron uh, micrograph, a cross section of a cell culture that shows bone marrow stromal cells here. Here's the nucleus of one, here's the nucleus of another and these L's are, are lymphocytes. They're developing B cells, um, mostly nucleus, a little bit of cytoplasm and you can see that they're directly interacting with the stromal cells and you can imagine IL-7 is being secreted and interacting with these lymphocytes. Okay, so let's uh, see if there's any questions about this lecture.
Uh, and then I'd be happy to answer in the last five or six minutes questions you may have about other lectures. Yeah. The question is, can immature monocytes in the blood deal with these immune complexes? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if they express the right FC um, complement receptor. Probably, but maybe, not in, maybe there's not enough of them or I'm not sure. But we can look at the table here. Right. Monocytes. It doesn't have doesn't say anything about monocytes and FC receptors. Or actually, we need to look at the complement receptors, so I don't know. Other questions? Uh, so do the macrophages also express uh, CR1? Yes, macrophages express CR1. I believe that um, they, okay. so they, they express CR1. They probably have more of it than the erythrocytes so that overall avidity is higher. And they may express receptors for other complement fragments. So together with CR1, uh, that leads to a, a higher affinity binding and basically a passing or stripping off of that immune complex. Is everybody just trying to get out of here to watch the Dodger game? So Ryan asked, where do the macrophages reside in the liver? Um, there's a specialized type of macrophage in the liver known as the Kupfer cell that are spread around. And I believe they're, they're more um, abundant near the portal veins and the, the vasculature. If anybody knows differently who's taken physiology more recently can speak up. Um, Macrophage-like cells are found in all tissues, as I said, but sometimes they have slightly different morphology and specialized functions, so they're given names like Kupfer cell um, and microglia in the brain. Oh, that was just a stretch. Yeah? Do immature B cells that, let's say, attack the human body, do they ever not get destroyed? What happens if, like, you fly doesn't have a response to, like, um, yeah. killing the um, yeah, so that could be the, the source of self-reactive B cells that can lead to autoimmune disease later. And we will deal with that issue in the next lecture about failures of deleting or inactivating self-reactive B cells. And then after the midterm, you'll learn about uh, ways of dealing with that for T cells. The gen general idea is that you have central tolerance and peripheral tolerance. Central tolerance. It's just like the, cent the central lymphoid organs. Developing B cells in the bone marrow at an immature stage are deleted if they're self-reactive. Thymocytes that are self-reactive are deleted in the thymus, but that's not 100% effective. So in the peripheral lymphoid organs, there are other mechanisms to prevent autoreactive cells from getting activated. I know people have questions about VDGA recombination. So why don't I open that lecture and then you guys can ask me. That would be this one. Yeah. OK. Um, DNA PK is involved in sensing double strand breaks and recruiting other proteins. It's one of the general DNA repair proteins. TDT uh, is a specific protein that's expressed in developing B cells and T cells uh, that adds nucleotides at the junction. So DNA PK is not, not a polymerase. It's an it's a enzyme that senses double strand breaks and is involved in, in uh, recruiting other DNA repair factors. No, TDT 
It's actually the polymerase that adds these nucleotides. I tried to, you know, say that we're not going to go over those details, but basically, since we have the time, um, what happens is that you remember from the video, a, um, the cleavage, the double strand break is initially results in what's known as a hairpin at the ends of the D and the J or the V and the J segments so that there's a covalent link between the, this nucleotide and that nucleotide. Um, and it's, a sli it's kind of almost a slightly open loop here. And then RAG uh, then nicks one strand. And it might happen here, but it might happen here, it might happen here. And you, if it happens over here, all these nucleotides are now on the same strand where this, these were on the bottom strand. And that leads to these p-nucleotides from palindrome. At that point, some of these may be digested away, but you also get addition of the n-nucleotides by TDT at the junction. Pairing of strands, unpaired nucleotides are removed by an exonuclease. And then if you look at the final sequence here, you can uh, you know, figure out which, which nucleotides came from this hairpin opening effect and the palindrome effect, which ones came from non-templated addition of n-nucleotides. You can see it gets very confusing. So what I want you to remember is that the joining is imprecise. You get a clean break at the heptamers, and the signal joint is lost. But at the coding joint, various processes lead to addition and subtraction of nucleotides. Um, TDT is involved in generating the additional nucleotides, the end nucleotides. Uh, but what you end up with is, is a sequence at the junction that's very different than what you would expect if you just put the D and the J directly together. Okay, it's 12.52. I'll see you on Friday.